basically the main focus of organizations that are successful and are effectively navigating all of the changes that digital has brought are the companies that are focused, the brands overall, not just in marketing, but the brands overall that are focused on achieving an outcome for their customers. Welcome to the Schweiki Media Expert webinar series where we team up with leading marketing and publishing experts to provide you with tips and best practices to help you grow your business and stay on the cutting edge. Welcome to the show. Hello, everyone. I'm here today with Michael Brenner, and Michael is a globally recognized keynote speaker, author of The Content Formula, and the CEO of Marketing Insider Group. He has worked in leadership positions in sales and marketing for global brands like SAP and Nielsen, as well as for thriving startups. Today, Michael shares his passion on leadership and marketing strategies that deliver customer value and business impact. He is recognized by the Huffington Post as a top business keynote speaker and by Forbes as a top CMO influencer. And today, we are going to be talking about leadership strategies for the digital and modern marketing age. Michael, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? Excellent. Doing excellent. A topic that I think a lot of marketing uh, managers and people in marketing departments are are, are curious to hear what you have to say because there seems to be a you know shift in focus or potentially from CEOs. So we, we need to see uh, to be a good CMO in this day and age. What what's needed? So mm -hmm. we'll uh, we'll just dig right in. Uh, first of all, just before we get going here, explain what you mean by leadership strategies. Are we talking about management skills or overall strategy skills or a combination of both? Well, I mean, I think there's a lot of people talking about leadership and, you know, today and, and you know, since the beginning of time probably. But, uh, you know, my, my definition is essentially, uh, I mean, leadership strategy is the ability of an individual, you know, in a leadership position like a manager or director or CEO or, um, you know, really just anybody in an organization to uh, to define the, the you know the vision the mission the goals of an, of the organization and to get the the team on board really to motivate to persuade to um, to even get uh, probably most importantly buy in from the organization to want to get behind uh, you know the achievement of those objectives. Yeah, and that buy-in uh, and setting those expectations is is something we're definitely going to get into because that's. Um, it's where a lot of this lies, I believe, you know, and just making sure everyone's aligned. So, so let's 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 dig right in here. Um, spend a bit of time talking about what you know. What qualities do you see are needed to be you know for sex, successful CMOs in this day and age? And and where should, and if you can touch on you know where their focus should be. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I say this probably every time I talk to somebody, but you know, digital has really changed everything, and you know, it's disrupted the things that we all know. I mean, it's disrupted the media, and it's disrupted uh, marketing, and it's disrupted, uh, you know, the, the 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 interaction we have as consumers with brands. It's it's disrupted everything, right? It's disrupted the music industry, the television. You know, I mean, we all know this, right? Yeah. What we don't often talk about is how it's absolutely disrupted the relationship between let's say an employee's you know group of employees and the organization or the CMO and the people who are trying to implement the chief marketing officers uh, objectives or the brand's objectives overall and so leadership has become a really important topic and you know the the reason i guess i i stumbled upon this is uh you know we've talked about this on the podcast before with you know ROI of content marketing was one of the biggest concerns and challenges i heard from CMOs and so i wrote the content formula to answer the question, to solve the problem for CMOs. And then I go back to people that, you know, sort of I, you know, either presented it to or, or sent them the book and, and I say, okay, so how's your content marketing program going? And they say, well, you know, we really haven't started implementing it. And they'd give me a list of excuses and reasons why. And what I, what I realized was it wasn't an, an, a CFO or an ROI challenge. It was a leadership challenge. It's a cultural um, pushback that takes place inside I think every organization, it's not just a CMO's problem, it's I think an executive problem across the board and it all starts with the sort of kind of changes that digital has brought upon the relationship between employees and their and their leaders. Yeah, and, and how people are, you know, making their these buying decisions and how, how processes work in this day and age. All of that has has shifted and changed and, you know, now we gotta adjust and we gotta figure out, okay, what what are the indicators now? Well, you know, we, back in the day, it probably was, you know, complete, you know, pretty, pretty straightforward. And now there's no, no such thing as a linear sales 
process anymore. It's all over the place. So, so where, where should you know one's focus be? You know what, what, um, you know what should they be thinking about? What should they be selling to their CEOs? And 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 I say selling. You know what should they be buying? You know what should they be thinking is the correct way? And then communicating that correctly to the higher ups. Well, you you actually sort of uh, touched upon it, uh, David, when you mentioned the buyer journey and and. Basically, the main focus of organizations that are successful and are effectively navigating all of the changes that digital has brought are the companies that are focused, the brands overall, not just in marketing, but the brands overall that are focused on achieving an outcome for their customers. And so in the consumer space, it would be, you know, P&G or, or, you know, Dove talking about how they make, you know, women's skin softer or, you know, and in the B2B space, it's definitely the companies that are focused um, you know, almost exclusively at the, you know, at the, at the expense of, of almost everything else in helping their buyers to make the best buying decision that they can. It's these kinds of organizations that are more successful, that are more effective, um, not just in marketing, like I said, but overall. And so, you know, in the marketing world, we kind of talk about the importance of customer experience and, you know, this sort of, uh, um, you know, the importance of thinking about the end-to-end -end customer experience, which is not just about, you know, not just about marketing messages, but extends all the way to the products that we deliver and the services that we provide to those customers. Um, it's it's a company cultural organizational challenge that needs to be solved, and it all starts with a focus on the customer. So, what CMOS need to do when they talk to CEOs is make sure that the company vision overall is focused on solving customer problems. Gotcha. Oh yeah, and that, that you, you've explained that very, very well. It's super clear. I mean, I think everybody can just take that and, and apply it across thousands and tens of thousands of different companies. But w w let's circle back around to like skill sets. Say you're a, an up and coming, you know, say you're a college student, or say you just graduated, or say you're a young marketing exec, or somebody who wants to get into it, or even say you're you've been doing this for a while and you want to sharpen up and make sure that you know you have all the skill sets. Um, needed, you know, in this day and age. And, you know, they can range from, you know, being, you know, somebody who's good graphically or, you know, somebody who has strategy and somebody who has some sales chops or understands automation and or understands branding. I mean, there's lots of things, you know, and it's my find all this in one person. But in general, what what do you think are like, hey, this is what you need to be studying and learning about. This is where you need to grow yourself. Here, here are the Not, might not be captured within one individual person. So can, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the skills that, that we're seeing that are most important um, aren't the same skills that we used to see. You know, it's, it's not like um, there's a book called The Situational Leader where, um, where the author talks about um, how there's managers and there's followers. Uh, and a manager needs the, you know, sort of communication skills and persuasive skills and, and, and you know, sort of dictation skills when, when the moment uh, requires, you know, actual sort of authoritarian kinds of approaches. What we're finding today is that the organizations that are successful, the, the people and the skills that they have are all about collaboration. And so we can talk about specific skills, and, and um, but it, interestingly enough, they all come back to collaboration. So, for example, I would say that you have to understand how to do digital marketing. Digital marketing, digital transformation is something I just wrote about yesterday, and the challenges CMOs are facing with digital disruption. Well, guess what? It all comes down to understanding how content moves across the web, and that's about collaboration, right? You can't force something through the social web. You have to collaborate with other people. It's why we talk about influencer marketing here is so important in 2017. We need other people to help us in today's world. <laughs> and so it's collaboration, whether it's with your fellow employees. Uh, you know, I, I'm not a designer. And so when I know I need something designed, um, you know, I don't just sort of, you know, uh, go on LinkedIn and look for a designer. I, I, you know, I, I'm looking, I'm asking my friends for referrals. Hey, do you know a great designer? And when I find that great designer, I don't just ask them to go do something. I explain what I'm trying to achieve and because they're a real person and they want to do work that matters, right? So it all comes back to collaboration. It all comes back to realizing that we live in a world that is completely interconnected um, and, and just simply telling somebody to do something um, because we're going to pay them or because they work for us doesn't work anymore. So, so you know, digital skills are important. Um, analytical skills are important. So understanding, 
you know, hey, you and I can work together, but what's the impact of that of that collaboration going to be? Um, mm -hmm. So analytical skills are still really, really important. Um, you know, and, and, and this focus on results, I think, as well. And, and this, you know, again, it's kind of back to this cultural component, but, you know, we, we just, we can't continue to focus on just doing what we're told. And, and there's always going to be an element. I think we all know those people that are just kind of, you know, they clock in, they clock out, they check the boxes, um, and then they go home and they collect a paycheck. And, and I've never wanted to work with those people. I don't know many people that want to work with those people or, or you know, uh, God forbid, be those people. Um, we want to work with people that care and we want to work with people that show, you know, real impact in the, in the, in the you know, things they're doing. So, so understanding the digital world that we live in, collaborating with others, analyzing results, and then showing the impact that it, that, that has, you know, I think those are the key focuses for skills. Yeah, I mean, and it you know it can sound fairly um, simple in the sense, hey, you got to have good communication skills, right? But but you bring up an interesting point. Some people can be caught up in the minutia of you know trying to you know concentrate all their you know take this course, take that course, you know get good at you know Facebook, and you know there's all there's there's like there's I'll tell you right now, I mean, there's zero chance I could run my company without my team. There, I don't mm -hmm. have all those skills, and but I, I'm okay with that, right? Mm -hmm. Because I just, I'm not Superman, and I, you know, and even if, you know, I, I don't, I've never met anybody that has all those skill sets. Let me just say that. So it's just, you, you know, that's okay. So you know, you could, you know, you might be, you will, you probably, you most likely are, you know, helping people like, hey, time out. You don't need to be great at all these things, but hey, you've got to be good at understanding how this stuff works, just in general, overall. And then you got to mm -hmm. communicate. So get out of your, your uh, you know, in your computer, and start, you know, get a return on those relationships. You know, you're hearing that more and more. I, I've probably done five podcasts in a row that every single one of them has mentioned that, um, mm -hmm. you know, in, in all various topics, all various topics. It's like, hey, you have got to. Communicate with people. You got to make it human. You got to make this stuff real, and that goes from talking to your, you know, from you know, from what you just said is, hey, you know, when you're when you are talking to somebody to do a project, don't just say, hey, design this. Explain it out. Talk it out. Mm -hmm. So that no, I, I hear you, and and, it, and it's you know, it's just you know, some of the most the best things are the simple ones like to, to bring attention to it. So yeah, you know, and understand it. And the analytical stuff that can be learned. You know, that can be learned. You know, you don't necessarily need to be a super duper analytical, but you need that to understand if your shit's working, right? So, um, awesome. Now, so I'm hearing these all, all these skills don't need to be with one, you know, within one person, but you do need to have communication. You need to have collaboration. You need to do that. Now, do you see this, these skill sets being different at all for like a super large enterprise organization versus, you know, uh, a small, business where maybe the owner is the marketing manager or medium-sized business where there's only like one person in the department do you see you know so any differences at all or if you if a big CMO is listening to this do they need to step up their game and under you know have more under their tool set what, what are your thoughts there yeah I mean I think obviously the politics and the bureaucracy and the you know just the, the org chart itself has to be taken into consideration when you're in a large organization and so you know you need to lead by influence uh, you know and 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 with you know uh, ideally with results behind you inside a large organization but but I think there's one thing that's common to both a large and a small you know marketer CMO um, you know or, or even an you know kind of entry level person is there's this this counterintuitive secret to success in marketing and it's it's empathy and empathy it's counterintuitive because as marketers for 75 years we've been taught and teaching other marketers that the way to be effective is to interrupt the audiences that we're trying to reach with promotional messages about how great our products or different our products are. Um, and that, that, that notion is, is now going in the reverse. Interruption and promotion is actually causing sales to decline, and that's been proven by the Advertising Research Foundation. And again, I want to comment, that's the Advertising Research Foundation, an organization developed to support the advertising industry, is finding that after about 40 messages, sales of a single product start to decline. Interruption and promotion are not just not working. They're actually causing the opposite effect. And so that's wow. one counterintuitive point. The other thing is that if we, if we lead with empathy, whether you're in a small organization or a large, 
it's counterintuitive because we're resisting that natural tendency that we all have as individuals to want to promote our products and services and talk about how great we are. But it's also very freeing. And what I mean by that is even if you're in a large organization where you're constantly looking at, you know, who's above you and who's below you and who's beside you in the org chart and trying to figure out how do I influence that person and how do I gain credibility with this person? How do I get my ideas heard? If we just lead with this idea that the customers know better what they want, that if we just listen to the signals they send us, the buyers are telling us what they want across their journey then it, it frees us up. It, it's empathy, and it's why it's counterintuitive, because it kind of goes against that natural tendency to promote. But it's also, it's, it's really um, empowering for us as individuals. And that's true if you're a one-person shop. I mean, I've been a CMO, a, a, a one-person CMO for two different companies, you know, with very little budget. And, and I tapped into the power of our customer base. I use them to tell our stories. I, I use them to tell me what I should be doing and which channels would work and where I should place the small amounts of budget that I did have. And so once we give up that control and we realize that we, we re really never had control, but once we intentionally uh, accept that we can give up control to our customers, use the insights that, that, that our buyers are, are kind of sending us over digital channels and signals, um, we can begin to take marketing from, you know, a, an order taker inside a large organization where the, the CMO is just doing what the CEO told him and, and the, the people below the CMO are just doing what the CMO told us, um, to really empowering and strategic business assets for the organization. As marketers, we, and, and more than anyone else, represent the wants and the needs of our customers. And, and we know better what problems they're facing and, and, the expert, and, and, and how to tap into the expertise that we have as companies to solve those. And if we really take on that, 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 that role of owning the problems that our customers are facing and asking our colleagues and our peers inside the organization, no matter how big the company is, to help solve those problems, that's when marketing can really start to implement a, a leadership strategy for the, for the modern age. Makes complete sense and a pretty strong argument, right? Hey, this isn't my idea. This is our customer's idea. That's right. Basically, that's right? right. So it's going right. to be hard to turn that down. So, you know, by bringing an emphasis of, you know, to kind of, you know, summarize what you're saying is, hey, look, listen, you know, have empathy, listen, like truly care, which is going to force you to listen, you know, truly look, ask. You know, and then when you have that stuff, it's, it's you create a compelling case. And then it's not a matter of selling or pushing anything. It's just, hey, presenting. Hey, look what's going on. And we all agree that this is what we want to do is to answer these questions and solve these problems, right? So here you go, right? So, yeah, that makes complete sense. Now, to circle back around, you mentioned interruption and promotion. Um, I don't think everybody quite understands where, you know, they might not understand exactly what you meant by that because we're still putting messages out there. We're still, you know, doing stuff. So you don't mean like any message or do you? So can, can you clarify what you meant? Like what is the decline, you know, the interruption, you know, what that is, is uh, what is declining here? Well, so the, the research specifically, now, I, I mean, I, I have my own interpretation of the research, but the research specifically showed that after 40 ad impressions, so I'm talking about an advertisement, whether that was in the form of a television ad, a radio spot, um, a newspaper, or you know, if anybody's still reading those <laughs> magazine um, ad. So when someone saw in, in a relatively short period of time, I think the study was done in about six weeks, 40 promotional messages, um, that was the point at which sales starts to decline. And if that sounds like a lot, the, the story I love to tell is, if you watch a NFL football game on a Sunday, there's 75 ad spots. And more than once, I've seen 60 ads from a single brand. <laughs> I wow. won't mention them. I won't mention them. They use the tagline, um, you know, real actor, real people, not actors. Um, and so maybe there's usually a lot of beards in, in those commercials. <laughs> it, it, might, it might be a car company. I'm not going to say who they are. But um, – uh, in fact, when I present this in, in a, a keynotes, I say real beards, not actors. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, the point Maybe. is that just one NFL football game, can, get, can you can see 40 ads from a single brand. And so it's not a lot. And, and so that was the research. That's, that's the research itself. 40 yeah. ad impressions within a relatively short period of time, sales of that product will actually start to decline or the consumer preference for that brand um, will, will start to decrease. So that, that's the research itself. My interpretation or, or you know, my, sort of the perspective I put on top of that is that 
we do promotional interruption and in our marketing messages because we think it's what works or it's because our boss thinks is what works, right? Uh, whether that's in the form of an advertisement itself, a paid media buy, or it's in the form of, you know, um, uh, a promotional brochure that we send to an event. Uh, you know, promotional messages come in many forms. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that it's true of all of those things. And so here's what I mean. I went to a content marketing conference uh, a couple of months ago, and as an attendee, I received a packet. And in that packet, was, you know, 50 pieces of, of paper on very high gloss, you know, sort of print that was, hey, you know, we're this company and we sell this and you should come to our booth and check it out so you can get a demo. Well, you know, I threw that one in the trash and then I saw the next one and it said the same thing. We're this company, we do this and we're better than uh, our competitors because of that. Come to our booth and see a demo. You know, and there, I think there was one company, maybe two, that had like a white paper, you know, or, or some sort of infographic or something that was actually not promotional and, and potentially helpful. No, at least those companies were trying not to just put themselves ahead of me as a potential buyer. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm talking about. That, yeah. th those 48 of the 50 pieces of paper were not just wasted. They gave me a bad impression of the brands that created those. And yeah. that's what I'm talking about. So the larger implication is, and I'm not saying we shouldn't, you know, on our websites talk about what we sell and, you know, what kind of companies we are. But to, to think about the, um, the kinds of, of communications that we put our investment, our, our sweat equity, and, and our passion into shouldn't be about us. They should be about our customers. That's the stuff that works. That's the stuff that's going to win. And here, you know, here's a message for the CEO and the CFO or the message for the CMOs and marketers that are struggling to get this message across. The brands that focus on their customers in this way are – are not just slightly more successful. They're hundreds of times more successful. And I'll give you another piece of research. So Jim Stengel, the former CMO at P&G, he came up with this theory that purpose-driven brands, by, by purpose-driven, he meant customer focus. And, and he analyzed customer focus based on the marketing messages they created, the, the mission statements that they publicly stated, um, just the general approach they took to their market, whether it was customer focused or brand focused. And, and he, he divided them into two groups, and he, call, he called the group of purpose-driven brands the Stengel 50. Over the course of, of the past 10 years in the stock market, the Stengel 50, again, these purpose-driven customer-focused companies, were 400 times more like, or, or had 400 wow. times higher stock prices than the brands that weren't. The other, he's found 50 companies out of the Fortune 500. So 50 companies out of the Fortune 500 were purpose-driven, had a 400% higher growth rate in their stock price than those that, that were not. In fact, the other 450 brands were completely flat over the course of the 10 years in, their, in the growth of their, of their stock price. And, and so for every, you could say for every dollar you invest as a, in a purpose-driven brand, you'll get $400 back. For every dollar you invest in a non-purpose-driven brand over 10 years, you will, return, you will get a zero return. And so that's the that's the financial impact of being customer or focused or purpose driven. Very interesting. And 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 correct me if I'm wrong. You're not saying never to put out a message of hey, this is what we do, this is who we are. But mm -hmm. to your point, and I think a lot of people have quoted this, and I've quoted it, you know, many times. Um, you know, you have basically three buying stages, right? You basically have awareness, consideration, and buying. Um, you can't slice that up into all these different things, but in general, that's what we, that's what we got. And your point is, you know, for every hundred pieces of awareness content, you would have ten consideration and one buying. So you're not saying never to say it, right? But you're just saying, hey, flip that around. You know, mm -hmm. have like you know, ninety percent of your stuff should be customer centric, um, if not more. And then you can mix in like, hey, this is what we do. This is who we are. When that time is right. Is it, I mean, just to clarify, is that what you're saying as well? You know, not to completely get rid of it, but the focus needs to flip around. Is that right, or correct me if I'm wrong there? No, you're absolutely right, and I think we've I think we brought up the Brenner Doctrine in our last podcast. That it was, uh, yeah. It's I, the point is that you can you can define this for yourself. For, no matter what kind of company you're in, you can do the research to figure out how many people on a monthly or weekly basis are searching for a solution, an answer to a question in your category. So if you're a CRM software company, there are lots of people that are trying to figure out, you know, what is CRM and how can it help me? And there's a hundred times more of them than are asking, what is, you know, SAP CRM software going to do for me? Mm 
There's a hundred times more people asking early stage simple questions than are asking to figure out, you know, or, or looking to figure out the the you know the best vendor, the price of the vendor, the features and benefits. And so the Brenner Doctrine is for every one piece of product content you can create. So I do think you should. You have to define what you sell. You have sure. to talk about what kind of company you are, and and you know you should talk about the the benefits that you create for your customers, all those things that we do. But I haven't found a single brand, not a single company that spends a hundred times more money or creates a hundred times more pieces of content focused on the early stage buyer. And that's the Brenner doctrine for every one piece of product focused content you create, which you should create, create a hundred times more that is focused purely non-promotionally on your customer and the problems that they're trying to solve. Awesome. Gotcha. Now, you know, you've mentioned these, you know, these benefits and if you're focused this way, you know, all these great things can happen, I believe, over time, right? Not right away. So that I think that's a struggle many CMOs face. You know, the combined pressure, and I've heard you talk about this and mention this, I think, specifically, not to quote you exactly, but something to the tune of, you know, CMOs are facing the combined pressure from CEOs to deliver revenue-producing marketing. But at the same time, marketers are still working off the old rules. So my question is that we all know that marketing takes some time to take form, sometimes upwards of at least six to 12 months or more. So how does one deal with this? Like, you know, hey, I'm selling you on this, this is what customers are saying, but it doesn't immediately click to like if you spent 50 grand on a direct mail piece that may or SEM campaign that might deliver re immediate results but no residual benefit. So how do you do this? How do you sell this to them? Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, I, I, I spent and wasted, you could even argue, a good six to 10 months trying to convince a couple of organizations to, to make these changes based on the math. You know, the math is important. Um, math doesn't move anybody to do anything, and you've got to stoke their fears. Uh, it, you, know, I, it, you know, I always say, you know, when, when the math doesn't work, you've got to move to fear and maybe a little bit of love. And what I mean by that is, is um, you know, the math, for example, I've already talked about a number of it. 40, 40 ad impressions cause sales to decline. So if, if you, Mr. CEO or Mrs. CMO, are telling me to promote our products in an ad, I'm telling you that, at, at, that, that that's going to not just not create return, it could potentially cause the sales of our products to decline. Okay, so if you don't buy that message or the fact that there's 100 more people looking for, you know, early stage um, answers in the buying journey that are looking for our product, or if you don't um, realize that 99.99% of banner ads never even get, you know, never get clicked on, let alone viewed, it, you know, again, the, the list of stats, there's a long litany of them I could run through. If those don't work, <laughs> then I think it really comes down to, you know, the things like the Stengel 50. I can show you, I can prove to you that the value of taking a more customer-centric approach is going to add dollars to the bottom line. And if we don't take that approach, our competitors will. And it's as simple as saying, go to your browser. You know, ask the CEO, CMO, go to the browser, go to your browser, type in the category of your solution and who shows up. And, you know, I've done this with three or four different brands. And, and very few brands, Salesforce shows up when you type in cloud computing or CRM software. So they do a great job because they focus on delivering customer-focused content, by the way. But there are very few brands that actually show up first for a, for a keyword search of the category of their solution. Well, guess who is showing up? Who's showing up are the companies that are focused on creating customer-focused content. And guess what buyers do when they start their buyer journey? They go to their search engine and they type a question into their browser. And so that's the fear. That's part of the fear, right? Is we, we have to drive, hey, there's a, there's a value in doing this. There's a significant opportunity cost in not doing it. And if we don't, our competitors will. And so that's the fear and the love that I think we have to, you know, learn. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm actually working on a video right now that I want to send out to my, my subscribers to my blog for free. Just here's the business case for content marketing. And it, it's really comes down to those arguments I just made. Um, and it's a template I want to send out to everybody that just says, hey, if you're trying to convince your boss to focus on the customer and to create more content focused on, on the value that, that you can, you can um, deliver for them, not in your product, but in your expertise, here's a business case deck that, that you can, you know, anyone can use, um, you know, having tried to sell this in and you know more than four or five dozen different brands um for everybody so so maybe maybe we'll share that link when i'm uh when we're done with the podcast uh, yeah absolutely and i think you're going to get a lot of virtual hugs from hundreds and thousands of people there for cool. that so very cool for you to do that but how, how you know in your experience how have you bought time how, how have you set those expectations that's not in 
you know, that goes back to, you know, one of the skills, the main skill sets that you mentioned at the beginning is, you know, collaboration, which comes down to effectively, you know, effectively communicating. But, you know, and that, you know, setting expectations is about communicating that. How, how have you gone about that? You know, how have you, you know, and you're, you know, how, how have you done it? I mean, I know you've been super successful and you train and you help. So, you know, share your experience there. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it helps, you know, I use, um, I have a chart that shows how effective content marketing um, map, like mapped into a chart looks exactly like the kind of accelerating return you get with a 401k. Um, and CEOs get that, you know, CFOs definitely get it. They get the value of accelerating returns. Another way, so that's sort of the value side of it. The other way on the cost side of the equation um, and actually, my, uh, our, our common friend Jason Miller at LinkedIn helped me with this data. Um, is what they showed is that an always-on approach to to um, to delivering effective content beats a one-time or or sort of variable time every single time. So what I mean by that is, if you spend a little bit of money in the market, let's say you spend a thousand dollars over the course of a year advertising your company. Well, if you, instead of spending that one thousand dollars once, you know, in the course of a week to promote your company and you spread that thousand dollars over the course of 12 months, the, per, the, the always on approach wins every time and it outperforms that one time sort of in market approach by factors of tens or hundreds. But and when? They, they've, they, they've actually um, done a great job of visualizing that and I, I get, that's another chart I, I'm happy to share with the audience. Um, but an always-on approach wins every single time. A customer-centric approach wins every single time. And so, you know, that's the, the yes, it takes time, um, just like everything. It takes time to build a relationship with your future spouse. Um, you know, and, and, you know, the other thing, too, is that these, these sort of quick fix, you know, uh, Google, you know, pay, paid search ads or, or quick ad buys, um, you know, that are once and done, they're like drugs. You get, you know, you make, you're buying clicks um, and that may feel good. And, but then what happens when you stop spending is the rush goes away and you need to spend more money to buy the drug. And, and so what we're talking about with customer centric, always on approach to marketing, it takes some time, but then you start to build, you start to build, attract an audience of really engaged people that could that potentially and start to convert to real buyers without having to continuously spend money. And so you can, you know, choose to become a drug addict or you can choose to live a healthy, you know, a healthy, um, productive, <laughs> effective life as a marketer by, you know, by, by thinking about the long-term impact of creating customer-focused content. Gotcha. Now, you know, obviously there's a lot of um, value that comes from this and just branding and awareness. How, how, and is that part of like your chart and what you share? I mean, because there's massive value in that, but again, it's one of those things that it will return, you know, residually over time. Um, how, how have you been able to justify slash show that? Yeah, I mean, you know, to be honest, when people have uh, a question about measuring the uh, impact of brand programs um, or the awareness, uh, they don't think of me. <laughs> as a former as a former sales guy, I have always believed that marketing should have quantifiable impact on the bottom line that you can measure and and present to a CFO. Um, and and you know, I spent my time my first few years as a marketer, you know, literally sitting right next to a, a, someone in finance who was helping me understand how to present the f financial impact of marketing activities, whether it's in straight leads and sales or it's even in the NPV, you know, net present value of a marketing investment versus some other kinds of capital investments. There's a ton of ways to do that. The way to measure a brand value, awareness, um, you know, those are cost accounting types of, of metrics that I've never really spent a lot of time focused on. But I will say this, what I have done is I've sort of faked it. And the way that I faked it with some, with some of the clients that I work with is through what I call digital share of voice. And, and so it's kind of back to that thing I was saying earlier is if you, if you do a search for, you know, the category of your solution, which brands show up first organically, organically. And you can actually, there's a, I use SEMrush, you can use Ahrefs, there's a number of tools that you can use to, that actually show the, the, physic, the, the digital impact um, in a visual way of one brand versus another inside a category. Um, and so I call that digital share of voice and, and, 
you know, so you can take, you know, SAP versus Oracle versus Salesforce versus IBM uh, versus Microsoft in the cloud computing space uh, as, one, as one example, um, based on the digital impressions that they're getting online organically. Uh, that's one way I think you can measure fair share of voice or digital share of voice. Um, it's okay. a sort of a proxy for brand awareness. Um, mm -hmm. The the reason I say it's a proxy is because essentially what it measures is the number of people that are either searching for you or sharing your content, specifically mentioning your brand online. And so it's a proxy for awareness because it's not actual awareness. We can't like you know reach into inside, inside people's brains uh, and figure that out. I, you know I've worked at, I worked at Nielsen where uh, people would ask us to measure brand awareness and and it was always. Uh, you know, more art than science, I would say. Um, that's why I think it's more important to focus on later stage types of metrics like what's your search ranking, what's your digital share of voice, how many subscribers does your content generate, how many leads are you getting organically from your marketing efforts, and how much sales are you getting, you know, specifically driven from your marketing uh, programs. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, and, and you obviously just need to combine that with, you know, the expectations that, that, that you've talked about. Now, if um, you know if someone's possibly listening and possibly feeling a little overwhelmed, like oh, I need to get better at this, or maybe even feeling inadequate, what advice would you have for them? Like, what, what what direction would you point them to get caught up to speed? You know, while they're still trying to perform their daily duties, and especially for well, this could apply to anybody, but you know, especially as one and two two person shops that you know mm -hmm. hearing this, like, yes, I want to be that, I want to do, I want to do all that, but. I have a billion things to do today, <laughs> right? Yeah. Any, any advice to kind of give them a hug or something, you know, yeah. to help them along? I'm, you know, I mean, at, at the risk of sounding, you know, promotional, um, it, you know, I, I, I would love to say read my blog, but, you know, I think it's, no, it's not true. fair. Uh, I will say I started my blog almost eight years ago, just over eight years ago, actually. Um, actually, it's eight years um, this next week, eight years next week. Um, and the first post I wrote was, I'm writing this blog to share the things that I'm learning in the journey that we're all on to figuring out, you know, sort of this new world digital marketing. But um, I was inspired by, uh, and, and I'll, you know, it's what I did when I first, you know, kind of got into marketing, is I just read as much as I could. And, uh -huh. you know, marketing profs, um, HubSpot's inbound um, blog, um, Content Marketing Institute, uh, CMO.com by Adobe, um, you know, those are all sites. I even, and, and I will say this with, with uh, you know, maybe some sarcasm, AdAge actually is a, is a great inspiration for me, but not because I think they're, um, they teach me anything that I should be doing, but more they give me inspiration on what to rant against. <laughs> yeah. Because I think they kind of represent the old guard and the old way of thinking. But, you know, it, but I think it's good to, to, to try to understand that other point of view as well. So those would be some of the publications. I think, you know, reading articles from those kinds of companies and those folks every single day, I think, is important. Um, and then maybe even start processing that in your own um, in your own words. And I, you know, I found the process of writing extremely helpful and therapeutic when I had to go explain something like. You know, eight years ago when a sales executive said, oh, you know, our buyers aren't on Twitter. We don't need to be on Twitter. And, you know, because I wrote the post on why we need to be on Twitter, um, I was able to then sort of – I knew the thought process and the, and the arguments to make to the salesperson who was making that argument to me. So I think it can be really helpful to, to, to not just read but also then to think about contributing and writing um, as well. But that, that would be my, my recommendation for the folks yeah. out there. No, no, I appreciate it. And, you know, you were – a little sheepish about it, but no, I mean, I'll just vouch for you. I mean, you're one of the main people that I've learned from, and that's what I, you know, that's what I did. You know, I just started to learn and read, and, and then I gravitated towards pretty much every single one that you mentioned. There's a couple there that I that I don't regularly follow, but 80% of them I do, in, in addition to some other people as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, just find find some people that, that are out there and, you know, to keep track of them, either subscribe to their, their e-newsletters or, you know, make a make a list on Twitter that, you know, that a feed that, you know, their stuff comes in. That's how I, I'm always seeing the new thing that they're putting out because they're in my expert list, right? And mm -hmm. I, I pick and choose the ones I want to read and notate them to look them over the weekend, you know? So, yeah, no. So, I mean, it's it's simple, but do it, you know, start learning. Learn from other people who've been there. It, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's absolutely helped me. And so follow Michael Brenner, I promise you. <laughs> You'll love it. <laughs> All right. So uh, to kind of uh, – 
close a little bit here. Any, you know, do you have one big prediction for us that something might change a year from now? I know you, you know, a lot changed from a year to today. So, um, any, any, any big predictions from you? Well, I mean, the, you know, just to kind of focus on the topic of the of the discussion that we've had, and thanks so much for having me. But the, you know, I'm so passionate because I I really do believe that culture is the new mandate for marketing, and it's why we're talking about you know leadership strategies for the digital age. Um, I think that we're going to hear more and more. You know, last year we started hearing about customer experience and you know um, sort of the importance of thinking you know that product marketing is dead, brand advertising is dead. You know, and and maybe those are a little dramatic kinds of statements, but customer experience is the only real way to market an organization. And the thing that gets in the way, the thing that gets in the way is culture. And that's why I think the prediction for me for 20, you know, late 2017 going into 2018 is that culture is the new mandate for marketing. CMOs are going to lead the cultural revolution to put the customer at the center of their organizations. Um, uh, marketing has always been the arbiter of customer insights and the, the wants and needs of customers. Now those changes need to take place across the entire organization. And so, you know, CMOs are going to be split into two camps, and we're starting to see this already. Um, the order takers are going to continue to love taking the advertising budgets from these big consumer brands um, who want to see their names and their logos splashed all over stadiums and billboards. And, and TV shows, um, and those see, those marketers are going to continue down the path of being an order taker in a tactical role, and then we're going to see, um, you know, the leaders in marketing take on a strategic uh, focus by putting culture a, as the mandate a, across the organization, and 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 finding uh, themselves sitting on top of a real business asset, marketing as a strategic business asset with quantifiable value that the CFO can count. And and so that's, I think, the shift that we're going to start to see into 2018. Gotcha. So it's about alignment and making sure everybody understands the why. You know, you can figure right. out the how, how and the what, right? And, and, you know, truth be told, it's going to make your job easier, way mm -hmm. easier, like yep. incredibly easier. Stop thinking you're the smartest person in the room, even if you might be. Most likely you're not, yep. but you know even if you might be, you know there's you know the brain power collective is is powerful, and especially if everybody's aligned and understand what the why of what you're doing there. Yep. So awesome, appreciate it, buddy. Um, how can people continue to learn from you? Yeah, you can find uh, my thoughts and insights on marketinginsidergroup.com um, or sh uh, follow me on Twitter at Brenner Michael. Uh, also find me on LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, a little bit on Instagram, not too much. But um, but yeah, I'd love to connect and, and interact with uh, with your audience there. Okay, and awesome. For the listeners, it's B-R-E-N-N-E-R-M-I-C-H-A-E-L at Brenner Michael, and it's Marketing Insider Group, correct? That's it. All right. All right, man. Appreciate it. And uh, until next time. Thanks so much, David. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Take care.